New Testament lesson comes to us from the great gospel of Matthew chapter 3, and I invite you to follow along. It can be found on page 1,499 in your pew Bibles. <clears throat> Matthew 3, picking up at verse 13 to the end of the chapter. Hear now God's truth. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to join me in prayer. Lord God Almighty, we do thank you so very much for this opportunity we have to gather here in this space, a space that we have allocated to be a place of devotion, of reflection, of challenge, equipment, encouragement, and ultimately to express our utter devotion to you as we seek to glorify you in all that we say and do. So Lord, even now, as we express our thanksgiving for the life that you've given us to live. May our hearts and minds be receptive to your words so that the words of my mouth and the meditations upon our hearts be made acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So friends, we come to this place together on this glorious day as it is recognized in the liturgical calendar as the Baptism of the Lord Day, the Sunday in which we remember Jesus' baptism. It is also a day in which we use the red vestments because it's going to be Ordination and Installation Day, which to me feels to be the most appropriate day to be able to install and ordain individuals into service of the church as Jesus even was commissioned where we recognize Jesus was commissioned on this Sunday. Well, one of the things that you may know about me, I'm certain, is that I love to ski. I mean, absolutely have an unquenchable passion for skiing. I love it. If there is an opportunity to ski, I'm there. And I want to be there. And I could be on a mountain all day. It's just a great place to be. Everything about what I do in preparation is for skiing. It's just that's how it is. And you know, there was this guy, his name was Bodie Miller. I don't know how many of you know Bodie Miller. And he was an Olympian and a world champion. And no matter what he did, whether it was grand slalom, slalom, downhill, didn't matter. He was getting a gold medal for it. He was the most decorated skier on the male side, second to Lindsey Vaughn. You know, the thing is amazing when you see who he is and how he was. And whenever you saw him in the Olympics or any of these professional skiers, what do you see? It's slathered with logos and company names all over their jerseys. Well, of course, they've been endorsed. Well, maybe you're not such a big skier like I am. Maybe you're more a NASCAR kind of guy. I don't know. And you look at those cars and you can't even see the regular paint color because it's just loaded with all the endorsements that come. Well, maybe you're not even into that either. Maybe you're into the political scene and you have an individual that comes up and praise God that at this time we don't have to face it yet, but it's coming. This is a harbinger for you, my friends. I endorse this message. Or that person endorses another candidate. And that comes as a double-edged sword, doesn't it? Sometimes the endorsement by somebody to somebody else may all of a sudden think, oh boy, 
What do we got here? If that guy thinks that that's going to be a good candidate. In some ways, Jesus has stepped into these muddy waters like that. Because John the Baptist, as he was out by the Jordan, baptizing, proclaiming a message, if you remember the story, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And as he was saying this, he was even telling the people, there is one coming that I am not even worthy to stoop down to untie his sandals. And then sometime later, uh, lo and behold, here comes Jesus up over the brow of the hill. And what happens? Jesus says, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus comes right down to John. And here it comes. Because John, all the while, while he's proclaiming this message of repentance, was staring into the eyes of the religious establishment, the leaders of the religious establishment, those with the political clout. And he said, you brood of vipers. Oh my gosh, who told you? So he instantly polarized himself from that which was the establishment and those who held power from who he was. And instantly here comes Jesus. And where does he align himself? Where does he place his endorsement? Not on the religious establishment, but he places it squarely on John's shoulders. And he looks John in the eye and he says, I need to be baptized by you. And John says, what? No, I should be baptized by you. And Jesus says, no, let it be so for now. Let us fulfill all righteousness in doing so. Hmm. An interesting concept, is it not? To think about being endorsed and what does this mean? How does that play out? And how do we understand that even as we look at this text? Well, I'm here to tell you that I believe that there are two key components to an endorsement. One is the value and second is the responsibility that comes with it. Right? Right? There's a huge value in being endorsed. If you're a skier like Bodie Miller who grows up on the eastern slopes of New Hampshire and right in the eye shot of Franconia Notch, and all of a sudden as he's busting it out day after day after day, honing his skills, and here comes a corporation knocking on his door saying, we want you to wear our equipment. Wow, what a boost, right? All of a sudden there's somebody, a big corporation, that recognizes your abilities? That's the first value of endorsement, a recognition of ability. And then the second thing that comes when you examine this whole idea of endorsement is the reality that you're not out there by yourself. You're not alone. You have a support network, a team of people that surround you to equip you. I don't know about you, but there may be days when you step into your world and into your vocation, and you may feel like, holy moly, nobody gets what I do. Nobody understands the passion that I have for the vocation that I'm pursuing. And you may feel like you're swimming these waters all by yourself. But then when an endorsement comes, wow, you're no longer alone. There's somebody there that says, I'm with you on this. I'm standing beside you on this. I recognize your ability, and I'm saying I am standing with you as you go out into this world. Wow. And that introduces the third aspect of a value of endorsement. It's encouragement. It's that motivation that comes. To be able to step into a a thing that you love, right, or an ability that you have, and all of a sudden, there's a corporation or a person that identifies that in you and appreciates that, supports you, and says, I'm coming alongside you to equip you to be able to do that which you are good at doing, right, provide you the resources. Wow, that's huge for any athlete. That encourages you to get up the next day and to do it again, to try and shave another hundredth of a second off as you make that turn. Imagine, you know, just this recently we had uh, Neil Pert. Some of you may recognize that name. An amazing rock and roll drummer who played for Rush. He just passed on into glory. I remember a few years ago I was watching a documentary on him. And there he was telling the interviewer, what he does as part of his routine. 
He says, yeah, there's sometimes when I'll be there and it'll be a four bar measure and I'll spend two to three hours just going over that particular rhythm just to get it right. And the guy was flabbergasted by this. But you know, to be able to practice like that can only happen when you know that there's encouragement that motivates you to do that. How many of us would rather perform than practice? I think most of us would rather be in the performance realm than to sit there and to go over our scales over and over again. Ay, ay, ay. Can't I do something different? How many of us know that if we go to the gym and we just keep doing it again and again and again, you know, it's hard. Some of us may have already broken our New Year's resolutions. <laughs> it's no fun to practice. But when somebody comes alongside you and all of a sudden recognizes that, boy, that gets your motor running. You're like, wow, okay, that person notices that I have these abilities. Well, then I better, yeah, I'm going to get rolling here. I want to get up and do it again. I'm going to go because I want to keep going. When this leads to the responsibility that comes with being endorsed. So you have this value that comes by having the recognition of your abilities. Having somebody stand beside you, support you, that you're not all by yourself. And that you are one <clears throat> who is encouraged and motivated to do what you do. Well, with that encouragement and that motivation to do what you do, to keep on rehearsing, to keep on practicing, to keep on working out, comes a responsibility to stay sharp, right? Stay sharp. Think about it from a job perspective. There you are. You're coming out of college. You're a little anxious. You've invested all this time into studying a certain particular field and all you put your job application together and you send it out there and the next thing you know, there's a company X comes by and knocks on your door and says, we want you. <laughs> wow, somebody recognized my abilities. That's awesome. So you're encouraged right there. With that, you know that there's somebody standing beside you who's going to equip you to do that which you've studied again and again and again to do. So what is it that you do as that professional or as that individual in your line of work? Do you continue to do best practices from 25, 30 years ago? No, you're going to be left in the dirt. You know, your employer's going to come to you and say, what are you doing? You're going to stay sharp. You're going to keep on studying. You're going to keep on the cutting edge of your certain particular vocation so that you will always be able to receive that endorsement by that corporation. You're never going to settle down. You're going to keep on pressing on and learn how to send email. Whoa. <laughs> what is it about this crazy phone anyway? You're going to learn about some of the newer things that are coming down the pike that are affecting your particular vocation so that you can still be on the edge of that podium, standing there going, yes, I'm on the top of my game doing exactly what this vocation requires of me. You're going to stay sharp, no matter what it would be, whatever your discipline is. That's crucial, right? Think about it. You know, we can see professional athletes where all of a sudden a, an, a, an endorsement goes away because they hadn't stayed sharp. The other aspect of the responsibility is living into the terms and conditions. We can instantly see what happened there with Michael Vick as Nike yanked out the endorsement for him. He wasn't living into the terms and conditions. The way he was living into his life was absolutely heinous to a lifestyle that Nike wanted to, to promote. And poor old Bodie Miller, he wanted to race again, but he didn't want to race on head skis. It's unfortunate. He wasn't able to race. And to live into the terms and conditions. And those sometimes can be binding, right? And unfortunate. But the reality is, there are terms and conditions when you're endorsed by somebody. When there is somebody who comes to you, even at your workplace, and says, this is your job description. This is what you need to do. 
And if you're not living into the corporate nature of what that responsibility is, ah, look what happened to the CEO of Boeing. That's unfortunate. This is the kind of stuff we look at. And you may be sitting there thinking, well, Ted, how does this have any kind of relationship to this baptism that John has and Jesus' baptism? Well, let's take a peek at it. Because I believe it hinges right on verse 15. And if we look at verse 15, it says this. But Jesus answered John, Let it be so, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Hmm. Have you ever read the Bible and all of a sudden you come across a passage? Really, there's two ways to handle it. You either just gloss right over it and say, oh, well, whatever, on to the next passage. <laughs> or you stop and you sit there and go, what is that? What does that mean? How does, how do I make sense of this? And that's one of those passages for me right here. What does it mean? That Jesus is telling John, let us do this for now because so we can fulfill all righteousness. And for us to be able to examine that in light of this idea of being endorsed, here's what it means. And you take it from that word righteousness. What is righteousness to start with? Righteousness is doing that which is right before God. And what is it that is right before God? That which God designed, right? That which God set in place as his purpose. That is righteousness. What is it that God expects for this particular thing? This is what righteousness is. And so when we live into righteousness, we are doing that which God has designed, that which God has purposed. And so when Jesus comes and tells John, first and foremost is an endorsement that says, what you are doing, John, is exactly what God has designed you to do. And I recognize that ability in you and what you are fulfilling right here. And we're going to continue that on all the way to its fullness for you will baptize me, which will communicate as a full endorsement of your ministry, which will likewise set the stage for God's endorsement of what I'm about to do, as we hear later on and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am pleased. Whoa! That is mind-blowing for us. Because at this point, we stop and we think, this is a wonderful story about Jesus and John. But then we got to go to the next level and think, how is it that what I am doing, how is it that I am fulfilling all righteousness in what it is that God has identified in me to do? Because one thing that we know from a theological standpoint if we're to take the idea of endorsement and to apply that in a theological term, is that we have been adopted. Right? Jesus is absolutely clear about this in John 15. He says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. That's what Jesus says. And all of a sudden, you sit there and you think, whoa, whoa, whoa. We are God's children. He has adopted us. He has called on us. It's nothing that we have done. Bodie Miller didn't go to Head and say, I want skis from you. Head skis went to Bodie Miller and said, we want you. They chose him. And so likewise, God is looking at you as he has bestowed gifts upon you. And he says, I recognize your abilities. I see what you bring to the table. And I'm calling to you to be my child. Wow. And I have bestowed on you these abilities that I recognize. And so now with that endorsement that God places upon who you are, what is the value that you have 
because of that. Not only is there the recognition that you are a child of God, there is the reality that you are not alone. No matter how far deep into the dark world of loneliness that you may find yourself, you are never away from God. Isn't that what David writes in Psalm 23? Though I go through the valley of darkness, the shadow of death, you are with me. You are never alone. There is someone named the God of the universe who stands to equip you and to provide you the skis, the hat, the poles, the boots, everything, so that what you do and what you've been called to do, you can do well. God knows what you need, and he will support you. That's huge. That's a major value. And that encouragement should motivate you to step into your responsibilities that you have, to stay sharp. How is it that you're staying sharp in your own discipleship and in your vocation, whether you are a politician, whether you are an educator, whether you're a grandma, whether you're a CEO, whether you're anything? How is it that you're staying sharp as you seek to understand what is it that God has designed for this particular position that I am living into, that God has given me the unique gifts to do. Do you realize that as well? That you have unique particular gifts that no one else has. And God identifies those and says, you're my child. And how are you fulfilling all righteousness as you step into that adoption and endorsement? This is what we think about. This is what gives us that courage. Now, here's the other good news. Jesus isn't a Fortune 500 company. You know, God, God in the flesh doesn't act like a Fortune 500 company so that there isn't going to come a day when all of a sudden you're going to show up at your desk and see a pink slip on there or that God's going to say, hey, you know what? My endorsement, I'm revoking that right now, brother. It's out the door. Boom. Because you haven't done what, what I asked you to do. No, God knows that we're going to trip. We don't do it on purpose, or we seek not to do it on purpose. God knows that we will fail, and he's a loving and merciful God, and you come before him and you ask for that forgiveness, and he will pull you up out of that mire, and he'll be able to equip you to go once again. Come on, let's hit that gate one more time. Let's go down that slope one more time. You can shave that hundredth of a second off. I'm telling you, you can do it. And so by that discipline, we come and we study his word. How often is it that we dive into this text? And you may even think to yourself, but Ted, there's nothing in here about physics. And I'll say, oh, yes, there is. And you step into this word and you begin to examine the reality of how it is that God established a natural order of things. And how does that play out when we have the laws of physics at play and God establishing those laws for a particular reason? And as a scientist... You'll explore those and translate that to the world around. This is awesome stuff, my friends. Even today, we're going to ordain our officers of elder, deacon, and trustee. They've been called. They've been selected. They didn't come knocking on the door saying, hey, I'll do this. No. Congregation came to them and said, we've recognized your abilities. We're setting you apart. We're bringing you into this place and we're endorsing you to be an elder. And you may be sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, I have no idea what to do here. Well, all the more you come before the presence of God and you say, Lord, what is it that is your design for this particular position? How is it that I can live into this in a manner that brings glory to your name? For that is ultimately what we do. Everything we do is for the glory of God. And so, friends, be encouraged with your life that you have been endorsed by a holy God, a sovereign God. And it's time to strap on those skis, man, and hit the slope and shave that turn just a little closer this time as we're going for gold. Amen. Wow. You know, when you hear a word like we had today, on this text of John the Baptist being endorsed by Jesus. 
Wow. Still be my vision. You see, as you go out into your vocations and how God has called you and identified your abilities, all the more, still be my vision. A ruler of all. There isn't one thing that goes beyond the touch of God's grasp. Even as Isaiah captured that in Isaiah 42, I called you. And don't you know that I set the splendor of the heavens? Go forth, my friends, with assurance. You've been endorsed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen.